Now that you've seen how we can use difference waves to draw very strong conclusions about the timing of processes like attention, categorization, and response selection, I'd like to show you a more detailed example. I'm going to talk about this study of the P3 wave in schizophrenia that we published many years ago. This study fits into the general theme of what are ERPs good for because it shows how the continuous nature of the ERP signal can allow us to determine which stages of processing are responsible for a difference in behavior between two groups of subjects. First though, I'd like to say a couple words about schizophrenia. The most distinctive features of schizophrenia are the positive symptoms, hallucinations, delusions, and disorganized thought and behavior. But schizophrenia also involves less obvious impairments in basic cognitive functions such as attention and working memory. These lower level cognitive impairments are actually a better predictor of long-term outcome than are the positive symptoms. And whereas antipsychotic medications are quite effective at treating hallucinations and delusions, we don't yet have a good treatment for the lower level cognitive impairments. But to develop treatments for those impairments, we need a better idea of exactly which cognitive systems are actually impaired. That's where ERPs come in. Many studies have used oddball paradigms to look at the P3 wave in schizophrenia. The data shown here are pretty representative. Most studies focus on the ERPs listed by the oddballs, and they find a reduced amplitude in people with schizophrenia compared to matched control subjects. Most of these oddball studies didn't look at response times, but we did. We found that people with schizophrenia were about 70 milliseconds slower than controls to respond to the oddballs, on average. This is actually consistent with tons of previous behavioral studies going back several decades. In almost any behavioral paradigm, response times are slowed in people with schizophrenia. But when you record ERPs in an oddball paradigm, the peak of the P3 wave for the oddballs doesn't appear to be any later in the schizophrenia group than in the control group. That's interesting. Response times are slowed, but the latency of the P3 doesn't appear to be slow. However, previous studies focused on the oddball trials, not the rare minus frequent difference wave. As you'll recall from a previous video, the rare minus frequent difference wave can't exceed zero until the brain has begun to determine whether the stimulus belongs to the rare category or the frequent category. The latency of the difference wave therefore tells us about the amount of time required to perceive and categorize the stimuli. With that in mind, our study examined the rare minus frequent difference wave in people with schizophrenia and matched control subjects. We presented letters and digits in the center of a computer monitor with one stimulus every 1500 plus or minus 150 milliseconds. The task was to press one button for letters and another button for digits. One of these categories was rare and the other was frequent, but everything was counterbalanced. As I showed you before, the amplitude for the oddballs during the P3 latency range was smaller in people with schizophrenia than in control subjects. Response times were delayed by about 70 milliseconds in the schizophrenia group, but there was no obvious difference in P3 latency. There was also a difference in amplitude during the P3 latency range for the frequent category and a 70 millisecond slowing of RTs in the schizophrenia group. That's interesting. The reduced amplitude in the schizophrenia group was present for the frequent category as well as for the rare category. It wasn't just for the oddballs. And if we look at the rare minus frequent difference waves, we see almost identical P3s in the two groups. The control subjects show an N2 that's largely missing in the schizophrenia group, but there was absolutely no group difference in the P3 wave. We can use the logic of difference waves to draw a very strong conclusion from this study. Because you can't have a rare minus frequent difference until you've perceived and categorized the stimulus, the finding of equivalent timing of the rare minus frequent difference in people with schizophrenia and control subjects tells us that the two groups perceived and categorized the stimuli equally quickly. The difference in response time must therefore reflect some kind of post-categorization slowing, perhaps in response preparation or execution. Consistent with this hypothesis, we found a major disruption of the lateralized readiness potential in the schizophrenia group. You can read about that in the paper. We've now replicated this LRP difference in several additional experiments. Just to recap, ERPs are great because they provide a continuous, high temporal resolution measure of the processes that occur between a stimulus and a response. This allows us to see neural processes that are not directly visible in behavior, such as shifts of covert attention and it allows us to ask which processes are responsible for differences in behavior between conditions or between groups. ERPs also have another common use that I mentioned in another video. ERP components like the mismatch negativity allow us to monitor processing in subjects who can't do behavioral tasks, such as infants and people in comas. So ERPs can help us understand neurocognitive functioning in the absence of behavioral measures, and when we can measure behavior, ERPs can help us understand the differences in behavior between groups or conditions.